Okay, so let's get started. And uh, welcome, Rachel, to the webinar. Good to have you here. And also, guys, any of the new guys, can you just pop in where you're from and how did you hear about the webinar? That would be absolutely fantastic. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this for you. And basically what this particular uh, thing about trust is, is uh, I love looking at the, where words come from. So I looked up the word trust, and you know what? It comes from uh, uh, Old Norse, which is the language that they used years ago in Sweden and Norway and so forth. And it basically means to be strong. That's what the, where the word comes from, or also the word solid. And I love that because the very base of the word comes from uh, solidity or strength. Okay? Now, how does that apply to people? Well, look, you're living life and you've got goals to achieve. You're much better off doing it if you have good, stable, trustworthy people around you that you can 100% rely upon. Okay? If you have good friends, um, good work colleagues, uh, good staff, uh, you're connected with good people in business, your chances of success are going to be very much higher. Okay? Now, if you don't have that around you, you can have all sorts of issues. Like, for example, if you have the wrong, if you chose the wrong nutritionist, let's say you went and picked a nutritionist who was giving you advice on what to eat, and they weren't giving you the right advice, then, you know, it can bring you in the wrong direction. Or if you, let's say, are going out with somebody for a couple of months and it's really not the right partner for you and they're not trustworthy, it's going to end you up in some trouble. Or if you're also with, uh, let's say, you have staff and you've hired some staff that are not reliable, you are going to have trouble in your business. So that's, that's this aspect of it. And this is why the area of trust is so important to basically help you, not just for yourself, even though it does give you strength, but also to help others because they also need people around them who they can trust. Life is, a, is lived with people. So that's the first message and that's the first diagram. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this webinar down into three major parts. And again, as I'm going through this, what I'd like you to do is I'm going to go over some information at the beginning here, step by step, point one, point two, and point three. I'd really like you to think of any examples that you have in your life that you have seen, observed, uh, anything at all, um, because uh, I want to make sure that you can relate to this. You can see how it goes in. So just think of any examples as we're going along here. Okay. And, um, and the same thing as well, when I'm going through a section, if there's any questions that you have, something that you don't fully understand, or you want to make any comments, feel free to pop it into the little chat there on Zoom. Okay, so now the first thing I'm going to go over with you is this thing called emotions. Now, emotions may seem to you, well, okay, what's that got to do with trust? Okay, if you can determine where somebody is on a long-term basis emotionally, you can predict or you can determine what kind of things they're going to do in life and you can predict from that whether you want to trust that person in life. Now, there's a little scale here that was developed from the Dianetics book that I just showed you, and it goes from 4, 4.0 down to the bottom, and I'm going to go over to you with you each section of this emotional scale. 4.0, we have enthusiasm. Now, enthusiasm, you all understand it, somebody who's enthusiastic and very, very, very interested, passionate about things, you know, like you see kids getting up in the morning really early, they really want to go to school, they just can't wait to go to school to see their friends. So anybody that has kids, you know, un until they reach teenager, of course, they kind of lose a little bit of interest, but generally you see kids and they're very enthusiastic about going in to see their friends in school. I guess an example there. Now down here at 3.5, we have strong interest. That's just, it's not exactly enthusiastic, but it's still up there, you know, somebody who's strongly interested in things, who's very interested in their football team, very interested in movies, very interested in whatever. Okay, now we go down to 3.0, which is mild interest. So you kind of see that it's kind of going down a little bit. However, somebody in mild interest is still interested. 
2.5, here we have boredom. This is the next level of the emotional scale. Boredom, basically somebody who's kind of on the fence right now, not really interested in things, not really disinterested in things, not really sure what they want to do. Um, bored, basically, on a general long-term basis. Now, as we go down here, below this point here, we've got 2.0, which is antagonism. Now, antagonism is basically uh, a situation where somebody is kind of, you know, choosing you as a target. In other words, critical or, you know, you get the idea that you're not being spoken with, you're being spoken to. So uh, you, an example would be, let's say, a, a teacher would be kind of giving out to the kids. It would be kind of a, an antagonistic manner. So that would be an example of, of that. Now, as we go down below here, we have anger. That's fairly obvious. You've often seen somebody who's angry. Then we have 1.0, which is covert hostility. Now, this is a very interesting one because it's often quite hard to see it. Sometimes you'll have somebody who appears to be very friendly to you, very interested in you, very helpful to you, but it's kind of surface. It's not really where it's at underneath. What actually is the case, it's covert, which means it's hidden, and there's some hostility there, which means that they're not really your friend. They're not really wanting to boost you up. They're kind of um, trying to pull you down in some way, shape, or form, uh, or against you. And then down here we have the grief area. And this is, okay, we all hit grief sometimes when we have bad news and so forth. But we're talking about somebody who's here on a long-term basis. Grief, very upset all the, all the time. Very easy for them to get upset about things and so forth. And then down at the bottom here, we have apathy. And apathy is the lowest point here. It's basically a point where a person is pretty much or very close to just giving up. And so somebody down here would be very, very hard to motivate. Now, with this particular chart here, we all go up and down this chart on different days, maybe different weeks. We all don't start off our morning enthusiastic like the kids do. You know, the kids come in and jump on your bed and say, oh, come on, let's go to school. And it's like half six in the morning and you really just want another hour of sleep. So there's no enthusiasm there, but they have enthusiasm. And then let's say if you hear some bad news during the day, let's say you've heard that somebody has passed away. It's not uncommon for somebody to go down into grief, to get very upset very easily. Um, or for some negative person to be approaching you in your life, it, it can sometimes happen that you're angry. So we all go up and down on this chart. But what we're interested in as part of this webinar is to find out where is somebody on a chronic level. So we're looking for the chronic. Now chronic basically means where is somebody on this chart on a long-term basis. Okay. So in other words, where is somebody, even though they fluctuate up and down. Where are they usually, normally? Are they normally angry? Are they normally down in grief? Are they normally enthusiastic? For example, you can have somebody who's very enthusiastic, who gets angry from time to time. Okay, but he only gets angry from time to time, then he's back up in enthusiasm. Or you have somebody who is angry all the time, who one or two times a year gets very enthusiastic, but then goes right back down to anger. So we're looking for where somebody is on a long-term basis. And the trick here is that in society, we're, we're all trying to be quite polite to each other. And, you know, when we're meeting people, it's all, there's, there's very much a social kind of a cover. Um, so you want to try and establish where somebody is. And hopefully the information I give you tonight might help you along with that. So that's the chart. Okay. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to go over this thing. And I'm going to show you now something um, to this camera here. This is the Hubbard chart of human evaluation. Now this came uh, following the Dianetics book, but it's a way that you can establish uh, using 24 different zones exactly uh, how to establish who should be your friend and who not. And what we're looking for here, by the way, as I'm going through this, you're looking for people who you want to get involved in your life, anybody over that band of 2.0. Okay, so 2.5 on up. From 2.0 on down, um, you're looking at a potential for trouble. So if you're getting associated with people on a long-term basis down in this band here, there's a very good chance that you could end up in some trouble in your life. Now, it's not to say that people down here are bad people. It's just that uh, whatever's happened to them in their life has brought them here, and they can be brought back up again. So that's the, that's the good thing. So that's that. 
So what I want to do is I want to go over two columns on this. Now there's, as I said, there's 24 different columns for each one of these sections on the emotional scale. Okay, very good. And let's see who else is there. Levente from Serbia, fantastic. And you heard about it from a good friend. That's really great. All right, so now the one I want to go over here, which is column number 16. And this is called method used by subject to handle others. Subject is basically the person, right? So I'm just gonna go over three things to give you a little bit of a tip on how you can determine where somebody is. Now, at 4.0, here's what we have. Here's how a person who's up here will get you to do things or will try to involve you in things. And here's the line, 4.0. By the way, if, everybody, if you're okay with this so far, you're understanding it okay, don't hesitate to give me a thumbs up. I'd love to see it on the thing because it kind of gives me an idea that you're tracking through it. Is everybody okay so far? You're understanding that all right? Good, Teresa, thank you very much. Mandeep, great. Actually, great, good, that's fantastic, guys. Just pop your comments into the chat there if you have any questions at all. Okay, so the very first thing is this. 4.0, how do they get your support? Here's how they do it. They gain, somebody here, gain support by creative enthusiasm and vitality backed by reason. So when somebody like this is trying to get you involved in something, they will explain it to you and it will be reasonable. You'll say, you know what, that makes sense. That's a great idea. It will click. It's something that would be constructive. And if you don't get it immediately, they'd happily explain it to you and draw it out for you or help you to understand it in some way. So this is how somebody at 4.0 gets you to participate or helps you to participate. And this could be a boss. Gain support by creative enthusiasm and vitality blocked, sorry, backed by reason. So they can passionately get you interested in something that they're also interested in or a project that they'd like you to participate in. Okay. Now, let's move down the chart here to 2.0. And by the way, as I'm going through this, if you think of anybody in your life who fits into this bracket, please pop it into the chat here. I'd love to see your examples of it because I'm going to ask you at the end of the section to think of any example of somebody that you've seen in your life who acts like this. Okay, next point here, we're just going to go down here to 2.0, antagonism. And here's how this person gets you to do things. Nags. Nags and bluntly criticizes to demand compliance with wishes. Nags and bluntly criticizes to demand compliance with wishes. With wishes. So nags means kind of always on it, kind of dick, 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 dick. and bluntly criticizes means just very sharp criticism of you. You know, and this could be, uh, you know, it could be telling you that you're not good enough, so therefore you should do this and this, or you're um, you're too thin, so that's why you should go um, and uh, put on some weight. Or you're not doing a good job and you, uh, there's a good chance that you could get sacked if you don't get your statistics moving up in the right direction. It's kind of like, you kind of feel like the target of it. It's not, it doesn't feel like it's, it's there to benefit you. It's, it's more like trying to control you by pointing out your negatives, negatives, negatives. So if you have a boss, it's not to say that all bosses are bad. By far, they're not, and they're trying to create a business. But sometimes you can come across, let's say, a boss who is just bluntly criticizing to get you to do things, saying you're not good enough for this, or finding fault with the good work that you have in order to get you busy so that the business does better. So that's that one. Now, the next one here, 0.5. We just go over one little section here. Now, even though, listen, somebody who's down in grief, yes, we can feel sympathy for the person because they've obviously had negative things happen to them and so forth. But generally around this band here, what can pop in here, and you may be shocked to hear this, but it's wild lying to gain sympathy. Wild lying to gain sympathy. So it's not to say that somebody down here isn't, hasn't been suffering, but the point that they're at right now is that somebody along this band will kind of try to explain to you that, look, how much of a victim they are. If it wasn't for bloody blah, blah, this wouldn't have happened to me. And if you didn't do this, and you know, it's all kind of trying to get sympathy, to pull on your heartstrings, to get you to do things. It's a very, very indirect way of getting you to do things. It's just pulling those heartstrings. 
And again, don't get me wrong, it's not that somebody in grief is a bad person. They can be brought up, but it's just something that triggers off around this area. So if you have somebody who gets upset all the time and is, is so forth, is very um, teary-eyed all the time, there's a good chance that might be triggering off. So, to summarize these, up here you've got somebody who gets your support by creative vitality and reasoning and enthusiasm. Down here you've got somebody who's nagging you, criticizing you to get you to do things. And down here, that's somebody who's pulling on your heartstrings very indirectly, looking for sympathy to get you to do things. Okay? So now what I'd like you to do, just for a moment, and I'd like you to think of an example of somebody in your life that maybe when we've been going over this that you thought of, or that you can think of right now, that fits into one of these brackets. In other words, somebody in your life that you, that kind of uses one of these methods to get you to do things. If they're up in enthusiasm and they're creatively getting you to do things, it's probably that there's a good chance that they are actually up there. If they're nagging and bluntly criticizing all the time, there's a good chance they're there. If the heartstrings are being pulled on a constant basis, there's a very good chance they're down there. So if you have any examples, I'm going to give you a moment just to pop your examples into the chat there. Uh, now, anybody that you, you don't have to name names, but just any examples here of uh, people that you have seen in your life. So I'll just give you a moment. I'm going to shut up now, give you a moment to think of an example there. So over to you. Okay, so we'll take the one that's gone in so far. A friend I used to know often came to me for ideas at work and took them for his own. Okay, and I would say that was pretty covertly hostile. Okay, that's a really good example. Thank you very much. Somebody who kind of apparently is on your side, but then you find out in the background that they aren't really. So that's good. And you're, very good. And your boss would think he was the bee's knees. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes uh, people can get the, um, uh, the idea that somebody's different than they actually are. So it's brilliant. And I looked like a bit of a plonker. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> good example. Okay, anybody else have any examples there? Okay, uh, Teresa, two of my sisters tried to pull at heartstrings and use guilt to get me to do things. Okay. Right, Teresa, now... There's, there's, there's two things on this one I want to mention as well. In the third section, I'll go over something inside that causes a person's buttons to get pressed. So if you have somebody who knows what buttons to press, they can use that against you. But then, yes, you can have the aspect of where somebody is, is constantly looking for sympathy to get you to, you know, change your schedule or overwork yourself or get stressed out. So good example, Teresa. Thank you so much. Uh, Levente. I had a friend I always felt I need to make him laugh because he is kind of sad all the time. Okay, good. And that's another example of here. It would be somebody who, let's say, pulling down the, the, the heartstrings. Okay. Now, there's one other little column here I want to go over briefly. So thank you all very much, first of all, for those examples. And if you have any more that you want to go over, then that's perfectly fine too. You want to pop them into the chat, that's good. Oh, Rachel, we better take your one there before we, before we move on. Exorcism wakes up five years later and tries calling him. Okay, ex-husband wakes up five years later and tries calling, saying teenage son has an issue, and blah, blah, let's do this, then this, but the solution was offered five years ago, and I must listen to him now and call him this ADHD doctor, and this one, but the issue is his control. Um, let me just see if I understand that one, Rachel. Five years later and tries calling, saying teenage son has an issue, and blah, blah, blah. So this and that, but the solution was offered five years ago, and I must... Oh, I see. Yes, okay. All right, so what I get from that there, Rachel, is that you had the solution five years ago, and now it's kind of being pushed back on you, saying, listen, this needs to be handled right now. It does sound a little bit like this band here. It does sound a bit like that. It doesn't mean that, you know, parents can get very, very concerned and very upset when there's something happening with the children. But yeah, it does sound like this area here. And you'll probably find, Rachel, that the person you're talking about probably didn't start off in life here. Most people start off in life up here, but as things happen in life, they tend to sink. And I'll go over that with you very shortly. So, Good example, Rachel. Thank you so much. Antoinette, a uh, friend is always saying how good I am at doing things and tries to get me to do things for them. So this is the opposite end of the scale. Now, Antoinette, there can be two aspects of this, and I'm, I'm sure your friend is perfectly fine. Obviously, there can be the covert hostility, which is somebody who's just pretending. Okay? But in actual fact, you can genuinely have somebody in your life who is enthusiastic, who is interested in your own good, wants you to do something better, wants you to do well, wants you to uh, improve yourself. You know, So there are people in life who are genuinely want you to do well and don't kind of just 
do it for sympathy's sake. So that, that's great. That does sound like somebody who's up there, uh, up around that band, and that's a brilliant example. Okay, so now before we move on to the next section, I want to show you this, this last little part here. And this is a, a beautiful column, which is called State of Your Possessions. So this is the next part. So we went over the method used by the person to handle others. Now we're going to go over the state of your possessions. So we're going to look at, very briefly, what are the state of a person's possessions in these bands. So here we go. 4.0, in excellent condition. 4.0, in excellent condition. Their house is in excellent condition. Their car is in excellent condition. Their bicycle is in excellent condition. Their kitchen is in excellent condition. The washing machine is working. The dryer is working. Everything's working. Their body is in good shape. You know, things are, it doesn't mean they have to be a supermodel, but you know, they're healthy and they're doing well. And things are in good shape. Things are clean, things are well kept up, things are tidy, you know. That's a sign of somebody who's up there in that band of enthusiasm. So if you know somebody in your life who really does, not obsessively now, not obsessively keeping things tidy, but just generally, enthusiastically and daily, keeping things in good shape, it's a sign of somebody who's up in enthusiasm. Now, that doesn't mean that from time to time you can't get lazy. You might have a couple of weeks where you just go, oh, you know what, I'm overworked. I do not want to do anything this week and your possessions go, you know, you haven't cleaned them in two weeks or whatever. But it doesn't mean that you don't get back into it again. Okay, so that's the first one, in excellent condition. Next one, 2.0 here, state of your possessions, very neglected. So somebody around this area here, if you see possessions in their house, they're very neglected. You know, the car hasn't been washed in months. The, the house never gets cleaned, you know. These things, the garden is, there's, you know, there's trees that don't even grow in the country, growing in the garden. Or there's, you know, there's mushrooms growing up through the floorboards. Okay, now that may be a bit extreme, but the point on this one here is the possessions are very neglected. Now, don't get me wrong, we can all sink down into that sometimes where we just neglect our possessions for a while. We're talking about on a long-term basis, okay? That's antagonism. And then as we go on down here to the 0.5 area, in very bad condition generally. So this would be even worse, in very bad condition generally. So down here, you've got possessions not in a fantastic condition, and it's a good little indication of somebody where, you know, they, let's say somebody up here, let's take personal dress, they generally tend to dress well because they want to see, they want to create a good impression, and they also want to create a good environment for people. They want to have a good, uh, to see things, and uh, see, for people to see a good image make them feel well. And by the way, I'm going to ask you for examples on this one as well. So if you can think of anybody in your life who fits into these brackets here, I'm going to ask you about them in a moment. So don't, don't forget that part. All right. And so then somebody up here would have very good, you know, their situations would be very good in terms of their, let's say their body, they're looking well. Uh, as I said, they don't have to be a supermodel, but they're dressed well, they're clean, their hair is dressed, uh, combed, and uh, shoes are polished, and uh, they just look well. Whereas somebody down here, in the, we generally, you know, even sometimes when they make an effort to look well, it just doesn't look well. Or, you know, their, their clothing is absolutely terrible, or they haven't washed in days, or they haven't washed in months. Um, you know, that's this kind of bracket down here. Okay, so that gives you an example. Summary, 4.0 possessions in excellent condition, very neglected, and in very bad condition generally. So these are, uh, this is the second tip on how you can determine where somebody is, and again, you're looking for people to be around you who are up above two on this chart. So, now is your opportunity again. So I'd like you to think of an example of somebody in your life or that you have seen that fits into those brackets in terms of possessions, in terms of what their physical appearance is, what their house is like, what their car is like, what their business is like, what their room is like, and um, pop it into the chat. So a friend of mine is a musician, he's quite like that. You know what, artists are people who generally want, generally I would say, want to improve things in life through their art. They want to bring the world up, they want to uh, improve life through beauty. And uh, they're often the target of uh, people like this who would kind of generally put them down in life. So it is, it's a major factor. Thank you very much. Okay, great. 
Okay, so that's what I wanted to just tell you about this. Anybody, anybody else has an example there, please pop it into the chat. So that's the basic message here. If you have somebody in your life who's going up and down, you need to get them to deal with this person who is putting them down in life because in most cases you will discover that the person is connected to that person. Okay, so let's go over the next part here. And again with this next part, this next part is really the central message of the webinar because this main part, this last section affects the other two in a massive way, a massive way. And what this is, number three. So we went over the last two aspects. We have just went over the uh, emotional scale and we went over um, people who are suppressive or negative people in your life. Now, the third part here we'll go over is this negative vibe. Okay, so basically we are kind of familiar with this. You know, when you meet somebody new, you know, you often get this idea that, you know, there's something about this person I don't like. There's something, I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's something I don't like about this person, so I'm going to stay away from them. I don't trust them. I don't know what it is, but I don't like the person. Now, everybody has got uh, an ability to sense things, okay? And I'm never going to knock anybody's ability to observe things and to see what they see and to have their own viewpoint on things. And that's valid. However, there is a part of your mind which can affect the way you perceive other people the way you think about others, and it can affect your decisions in terms of trusting other people. I'm going to draw this out for you now. i get rid of this here. And this part is, is basically to do with the mind. Okay, Your mind is basically like your own mental computer that you carry around every day and you use every day to solve problems and fix things. Now, there's a negative part of this mind which stores up all the bad things that happen to you. And we call it in Dianetics the reactive mind. And the reason we call it reactive is because it just reacts. It's like a push button part of the mind. And it's not under your control. In other words, if you were fully in control of your mind, you would be able to control how you feel, you know, on a certain day, what you're thinking, how you're getting on, you know, what you're doing, your decisions that you make, the thoughts that you're having, you know, you'd be able to control them. But there's a part of your mind which affects your thinking. It affects the way you think about things in life. So that is the, it's, it's basically like a hidden part of your mind that can affect your perception of others. It comes in and it affects the way you think. And it's a reactive mind. Now, you're probably not aware of what's in it because the information and the things that have happened are just generally buried. So when you have an accident or an operation or something very physically painful happens to you or you have a very severe emotion loss, it kind of gets buried in this part of the mind which kind of sits there in the background and it's kind of waiting for something similar to happen again to kind of protect you from getting into the same situation again. So I'm going to give you, maybe just give you a couple of examples of how this reactive mind works. And the first example I can give you is let's say you have a guy who was, let's say he was beaten up by a tall guy as a kid. He was beaten up by somebody who was, let's say, six foot four. And he was like, whatever, five foot zero. And um, so this happened to him when he was like 10 or 15 years of, of age, right? And then years later, he's working in an office. He's completely forgotten about this incident that happened to him. And there's this new guy that moves into the office. A colleague joins the company. And this guy is really tall as well. He's like six foot seven or eight, really tall. And for some reason, you just don't like him. You just don't, it's not his height. And you say, well, it's definitely, he's too tall. I don't like his hair. I don't like his this. But in actual fact, what's happening is, what happened to you before that beating that you got by that tall guy is being affected by the reactive mind and is affecting the way you think 
about this new guy. Okay? So that's an example of how your reactive mind can affect your opinion of somebody who is completely separate from what actually occurred back here. This is how you can have a negative judgment. It, the person may be completely fine. They may be totally 100% trustworthy person, enthusiastic. They could be very creative. Their possessions could be great, in great condition. But yet, just because they're tall, and you had a bad experience of somebody who was also tall, this reactive mind comes in and says, no, stay away from this person. And then you have to invent reasons, you have to invent things wrong with them then to justify why you feel like moving away. So in other words, the baggage from your past can affect the way you think about others. So, next example. So the next example would be, let's say, if you have somebody who was beaten up by, uh, let's say, you have, let's say, I don't know, somebody moves to a different city, moves to Cork uh, in Ireland, and then gets beaten up one night by a bald-headed guy on the street. Okay, fine. All right, he gets over that. But then from that point on, any times he sees a bald guy, he gets this kind of feeling, like a feeling of fear. And it's not because the new bald person is a bad person, but because that new bald person reactively reminds him of the old bald person, and so he gets a bit suspicious and wary and cautious, and so tends to stay away from that person. So now let's move on to the subject of losses. Okay? Now, uh, because that can also be stored in this reactive mind. It's not just moments of physical pain, it's also moments of emotional pain. So, let's say you have an example of a person who lost a girl, and he was betrayed by her, and let's say she was blonde, and he loved her to bits. He was really passionate about this girl, and she left him. Let's say he was going out with her for five years or whatever. Destroyed. So now every time he sees, if he tries to get into a relationship, he avoids blonde girls. Not because there's anything wrong with them. Not because they're, you know, they're not enthusiastic or interested in life. But simply because there's something about them he now doesn't like. And he's not thinking, oh, it's the blonde hair. He doesn't quite connect the two. He doesn't quite think, oh, it's the blonde hair that reminds me of the blonde haired person. I think I'll stay away from them and that's the reason. No, it's all happening reactively. He just can't put his finger on it. For some reason, he doesn't want to have anything to do with this new blonde girl who is actually perfect for him. Perfect for him. But the reactive mind tells him that she's bad. Okay? Now, if a person has had too many losses Let's say he's had too many girls who let him down in the past, and it just happened too many times. Eventually, what happens is the person comes up with this idea. Okay, all women, and you can change that to men if you want, are, and you can fill in the blank. In other words, every new relationship the person tries to get into He's already decided all women are the same. They're all the same. Why is he thinking like that? Because this reactive mind is getting big, much bigger than it was, and it's affecting the way he thinks about relationships in general. And so it can even get to a point where he starts thinking, you know what, it's not just women are bad, but you know what, I don't trust anybody. In fact, what I'm going to do now is I'm only going to associate with animals. I'm only going to have animals around, and I don't like people anyway because you can't trust them. Okay, good. So I hope that makes sense. Now, what I'd like to do is this is your chance for participation. Okay, um, great. And Paul just put in a little, uh, Levente, you had an example. Uh, a friend who got injured many times physically. Uh, so I guess it was doing roller coasters, if you know what I mean. Yes, exactly. So a person who is roller coastering Levente would. More, more often than not, get themselves into trouble. They could have accidents or get ill and so forth. So that's, that's true. And Paul wondered where this negative stuff came from. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go into that in a moment, Paul, but what is the answer to this? But what I'd like to do before we do this is I'm going to give you the stage again. And I'm going to ask you to think of an example, okay, of somebody in your life. Some example that you've seen where a person, um, now it could be somebody that you know or you have observed, who is very suspicious of other people, you know, very, very cautious, and just tells you, listen, you can't trust anybody, you know? So I'd like you just to think about an example of somebody that you know in your life who is very suspicious 
of other people. You don't have to name names, but just you can say a colleague or a friend or whatever, pop them into the chat if you don't mind. Because that is an indication of the reactive mind in force to a large degree or a small degree. So that's basically the reactive mind. So I'm going to go over, when I read your examples, and I hope you're all typing now as I'm rubbing this off the board. Um, when I read your examples, I'm going to show you the solution to that as well. I'm going to show you the solution. Okay. Yeah. Repeat the question. Right, Rachel, thank you. I would like you to think of an example of somebody in your life who is suspicious of everybody or anybody that you've known that is just like very wary, very cautious, very skeptical. Any example that you can think of that kind of fits into that bracket. And because the message here is that the more bad experiences a person has with other people, the more likely it is they're going to be suspicious of disrelated people in the future. And when I say disrelated, I mean disrelated to the people that hurt them in the past. So that's what I wanted to uh, get an example of. Yes, Levente, yeah. There, <laughs> there is a lot of stuff in the reactive mind and it is worth getting rid of. Good, good point. Okay, so good. If you can just pop that example, anybody else has an example there, pop them into the chat. Uh, don't worry if you don't, we're going to move on. I want to show you the solution for this. Now, why did I say that the, I'm going to draw this out for you right now. So why did I say that number three is the most important? So remember, I need to summarize this. The first one we went over is the emotional scale, okay? Emotions. You need to understand where somebody is at on a long-term basis emotionally, because from that, you can determine what they're going to do next. The next thing we went over is uh, roller coaster. And this is basically somebody who goes up and down all the time in life. And the solution for that is to save yourself trouble, to save yourself heartache with that person, is to get them to deal with the person that's putting them down. And the third and most important thing is that vibe. And the solution to that is clear the reactive mind. Now, the reason this is the most important is because it can have an effect on your ability to use this information here to judge people, and it can also affect your ability to deal with negative people or even to deal with the roller coaster. If you are stressed out dealing with these types of people, that is most likely this reactive mind kicking in. So what is the solution to this? The solution to this is to clear up the pain from your past. Clear up the pain from your past. And if you want to help somebody to improve their ability to trust other people, help them to clear up the pain from the past. How do you do that? Listen, there's so many people with so many different opinions on this. I've stuck with this subject for over 25 years. Why? Because it works. And here's the very basic structure of it. Dianetics, and as I mentioned, I'm going to show you this book at the very end. Uh, this is the book that I referred to at the beginning, Dianetics. Dianetics uses a procedure called auditing. And auditing means to listen and to guide. You've got a person who's called an auditor and an auditor is basically a person who listens and guides. And you have a person who's receiving the auditing and we call this person a pre, means before, and clear. Pre-clear means a person who is on the road to becoming clear of the baggage. And what you're addressing here is you're trying to get rid of the pain from these incidents. You're not necessarily trying to get rid of them. What you're trying to do is get rid of the pain from the incident. So Dianetics is a very exact step-by-step -step procedure that you use in order to clear up the pain from the past. And it has a very exact end result. And that exact end result, I'm just going to draw this happy smiley person here, is called clear. Now, a clear is not a different person. It is the same person, but he's just cleared up the pain from the past. And it's not somebody who's always enthusiastic. He can go up and down on this emotional chart, as anybody can, but in general, stabilizes very, very high. And even when something bad happens, can recover from it very, very quickly. So that is the, it's a very simplified 
and very overview-like version of what, I, uh, what the solution is and what auditing is about. So those are the three main messages from this webinar. Number one, learn your emotional chart. Number two, learn how to deal with roller coaster people. And number three is clear up the reactive mind. This is the most important part of it because if you handle this, it's so much more easy to handle this and this. So that would be number one step, okay? So that's basically that. Now, so this reactive mind is the thing that basically ruins your ability to trust people, ruins your ability to um, learn how to get along with other people, ruins relationships, makes you hire the wrong staff, makes you fire the wrong staff, makes you pick the wrong boss, take the wrong arguments, all this type of thing, okay? And the trouble with this is, is that most people, um, they generally, you know, have kind of resigned themselves to the fact that it's just not going to get any better. They're just kind of like, there's, there's nothing really I can do about it, okay? So, what I want to do now is we're coming up to the end of the webinar. I hope this has been of benefit to you and it's, a, it's, helped, it's helped you. And if you have any other questions, you can pop them into the chat there. Um, yeah, and Rachel, just to pick up your questions there. Um, um, yeah, Mandeep says there's a family member specifically suspicious of other family members. Thank you, Mandeep. Hurt by a lot of specific members. Okay, thank you. And Rachel, so clear up the pain from the past. Good one. But what if you don't have enough light to help another clear the pain of your path? Good. Well, that is a fantastic question, Rachel. I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to do to handle that. Because it is important that if you're going to help somebody else, it's very important that you yourself are in a good situation yourself as well. So, I am going to make some recommendations for you. Now, I myself am a trained Dianetics counsellor. I use Dianetics with other people and I have been doing this for very many years. So, I'm a technical person, but I want to give you some recommendations uh, to get you started because I really truly recommend that you get started as soon as possible. So uh, there's a couple of things that I'm going to show you. The first thing is the book. I'm going to pop this up on the screen for you um, uh, very shortly. So basically the Dianetics book is the very first thing and this book contains three parts. The first part explains to you about what the end result of Dianetics is which is called the clear. The second part explains to you all about how your mind works how your mind causes you not to trust people, why people lose their trust in others, why people go down the slippery slope of life, and exactly how it affects their body and their emotions. And then the third part of the book shows you the step-by-step -step techniques in full detail on how to clear up the baggage. And this answers your question um, there, Rachel, and what shows you how to do it. So that's the book. And for book readers, we're very happy to read a book then uh, get yourself a copy of that and the link will be up on the, on the chat there for you. Now, there's a second thing. This is option two for you. And so with the book, right, there's something extra that goes with that. And I'm going to pop this on the screen right now. This is a little package that we put together to help you to get started on Dianetics immediately. It's the DVD. So this goes with the book. So when you're reading the book, you basically watch the DVD as well. There's 18 mini movies on it. And for each section of the book, you watch the, the little part of the DVD and it gives you the visual to go along with the written. And also in the second DVD, it goes through step by step exactly what you do to do Dianetics. Now, now I have to tell you, Dianetics is not something that you do in five minutes and it's all done. It does take work, but the results are stable. And when you've cleared up this stuff, you don't have to keep clearing it up again and again. So that's the book and the DVD. Now there's a third part of this particular package, which I'm going to pop up here now. And that is to do with the home study course. It's basically a correspondence course. So as you're reading the book and you're watching the DVD, you then answer your first lesson on, let's say, chapter one. You've, watched, uh, you've read the chapter one, you've watched the DVD on chapter one, and now you're going to answer the questions and you send them into us. Now, the advantage of this is that you've got a Dianetics team that actually helps you to get along and to actually be able to apply what you've learned. And that's the beauty of this home study course. Now, as I said, I'm not the sales guy here, but I really strongly recommend that you get started on this particular uh, package because it, the benefit of it is it means that you're not just stuck with a book that may or may not get read, may or may not end up in a bookshelf. At least with this 
home study correspondence course, you're getting the full view of exactly how to use Dianetics immediately to improve your life. And you will also have a team of people to help you to get through it. And they'll send you a reminder every week, say, listen, have you, how are you getting on on your uh, home study course? Do you need any help? Do you have any questions? So it's really, really good. So that's that. Now, um, the, uh, I've been reliably told that there's a special offer on this package, and that's going to be shown to you now. Uh, that's going to come up. I think uh, it's basically, yeah, there it is. Uh, there's a special uh, package price on it tonight for the webinar, and that second link will bring you to it. It's basically 50 euros for the package, and it actually includes postage, which is really, really good. And that includes not just the materials, but also the service for the entire length of time that you're on the home study course. Okay, folks, and then so there's your link for it. So if you're interested, grab yourself a copy of it, and that will be sent out to you immediately. And um, yeah, so I really do strongly recommend that. Okay, everybody, so there you go. That's uh, my webinar on knowing who to trust. Again, the emotions. Uh, the second part is the roller coaster. And the third part, and most important, is clearing the reactive mind. Keep an eye on those things, and your ability to trust people will come up. Your ability to determine who to get involved with in your life will come up. And remember, you need to associate with people who are above two on that emotional scale. And uh, your life will become an awful lot better because you will have been surrounded by people who are doing a lot better themselves and you'll be able to build a good strong network of reliable people around you that you care about and that care about you and that are pushing you forward. Okay, uh, so listen, I want to just thank everybody for your attendance tonight. I thank you for giving me your hour. I know you could have been doing something else, but you chose to be with me. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, Paul, Mandeep, uh, Akshay, Carmel, Deirdre, Teresa, Rachel, Antoinette, thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, Rachel, I'm, I have to hear this again and again. Great, good, I'm glad that you're coming back again. And so um, I wish you all a beautiful evening. Uh, enjoy using this information, and I hope to see you again very soon at uh, future webinars. And again, if you have any questions, then you can always pop them into the chat or whatever, okay? Teresa, thank you for the wave, goodbye. And um, okay, everybody, thanks very much. Have a beautiful evening. Take care of yourselves.